Welcome to a new episode of the Animal Liberation Hour, where we seek insight from animal rights and liberation activists around the world so that we can think, reflect, learn, and be inspired together. My name is Shreya, and this is the Animal Liberation Hour. This podcast is brought to you by Animal Activism Mentorship. AAM's mission is to grow and strengthen the animal rights movement by providing a space for activists to have access to a community and various educational resources. From one-on-one mentorship, to free workshops and trainings, to this podcast, AAM aims to empower humans to take action for the animals so that we can create a kind, just, and equitable world for all creatures. For more information, visit animalactivismmentorship.com or our link tree, which you can find in the show notes. There, you can sign up for a free mentor, keep up with all things AAM, and donate so that we can continue this important work for the animals. In this episode, we will chat with Shobangi, the policy and legislation lead at the youth-led grassroots nonprofit, The Raven Corps. Shubangi is currently a freshman at the University of California, Berkeley, majoring in political science. She plans to pursue law school in the future and remains active in local and state level political campaigns. The Raven Corps is a community of youth activists and a nonprofit organization devoted to collective liberation advocacy. They design and implement strategic campaigns aimed at addressing the systemic roots of oppression, simultaneously fighting for human beings, fellow animals, and our natural world. Their current campaign is Operation Mind Over Milk that is geared to raising public awareness on the horrors of the dairy industry and increasing access to climate, student, and animal-friendly plant milks in over 100,000 schools in the United States where cow's milk is the only reimbursable beverage option for 30 million young people. Activists like the Ravencore community and Shibangi not only provide hope for our future, but also inspire all generations to get active and be the positive change we hope to see in this world. So without any further delay, I bring you the fierce raven, Shibangi. I'm Shabangi Bose. I'm 18. I'm going to be a freshman at Berkeley in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, and I'm with the Raven Corps as their policy and legislative lead. Awesome. So tell us what is Raven Corps? Give us the whole spiel. Yeah, so we are a collective liberation, like nonprofit organization um, that is youth led and is basically like by activists for activists. So we are pretty radical in our approach to activism and advocacy, and we're very grassroots. Um, and we, we are nationwide. We have not chapters, but we have ravens or members across the country. Um, so we are pretty decentralized and um, yeah, we really believe that animal liberation is just a piece of the larger puzzle um, Mm -hmm. and that like all the different like various liberation movements that we're seeing are all just different facets of like the same fight for collective liberation. So that's our approach to advocacy. I love that. And that is so important. And I feel like I want to go in so many avenues here because I... And I think I mentioned this to you when we were trying to schedule this, that I wish I had a group yeah. like this when I was in high school to, you know, really get me excited about yeah. doing boots on the ground, grassroots activism. I haven't been doing that for all that long, but no, but I'm just so excited to see all of the the work that you're doing. And when you describe yourselves as radical, what does that mean to you as an organization? And the reason why I ask is because that I, I I don't necessarily understand why people are scared by the word radical. Yeah. I, it's like, 
I've always thought like, well, yeah, because we're not going to, you know, sugarcoat our way to liberation, right? Exactly. So, so what, like, so what does that mean to you? And does that ever, and how, or have you ever experienced um, pushback as a younger group of activists? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's definitely a discussion we have internally too about like, you know, do we want to call ourselves radical? Why do we do that? And all of that. I think to me, it's just like, you're willing to go against the grain, which is so important if you are really a firm believer in collective liberation, because, you know, you have to be against the whole system because it's, that's what's perpetuating everything. So to me, being radical is just like being against the grain, not being afraid to call out, can we curse? Call out shit when we see it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I think that's what it means to me. I think it's just like, Obviously, like, I don't want to make people uncomfortable um, in, like, a dangerous way, in a way that would, like, harm them. But to make them, like, uncomfortable with the way things are Mm -hmm. enough to, like, push themselves to do something. I think that's, we're not, we're not afraid of that. And I think as a group of younger activists, there's, like, a couple of things that come in. It's, like, if we call ourselves radical and, like, the general, like, approach we take to things we... We don't get taken very seriously. It's just like, oh, you guys are just like a couple of like young kids just, you know, like having fun or whatever. You don't understand how the real world works yet. You know, you have to take these different routes. And it's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry. Like, I know that there's different, more like appropriate, quote unquote, ways to approach things. But I'm not doing it that way because it hasn't been effective for so long. Right. So we are going to go grassroots. We are going to go boots on the ground because you got to meet people where they're at right now. And I, I don't think traditional like advocacy organizations in animal advocacy, but I think in like across multiple movements, I don't think they're doing that sort of work, you know, so. Yeah. And so is your focus at the Raven for mostly animal rights related or do you also organize when it comes to other social injustice spaces as well? Yeah. Yeah, so traditionally we've been, um, I guess if we look through like the past seven years, the majority of the time we've spent it on multiple issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, animal rights, but also social justice and climate. So we've tackled a lot of the those issues at the same time through like different sort of like um, activities, not activities, but like different asks and that sort of stuff, right? But more recently in the past two years or so, we've become hyper focused on one thing our and that's our main operation which is operation mind over milk which is basically our fight to get dairy out of schools because that's a multifaceted issue that has ramifications for racial justice climate animal rights you know just it, it really is a multifaceted issue i mean even just on like government overreach too right so that's been our main focus yeah that, that was very well said. And honestly, I'm like, these are things that I have only started thinking about recently. I think a lot of people think about later on in life. And yeah. And what inspired this group? Like what what how did the Raven Corps come to be? Were you all students in the same school? Or how did you create this network across the country? Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't there at the founding and which that was like seven years ago I would have been in fifth grade um but Claire our ED our executive director um she she's like an adult um she was doing humane education and helped found this high school club which is the original iteration of the Raven Corps and those were the original Ravens and then they decided that like the high school club was working out and they wanted to go like big time with it. They wanted to make a nonprofit. And it was because they saw a lack of like the, of youth voices in the AR movement. And they're like, we're doing something that a lot of people aren't doing right now. So we want to make it a nonprofit. And since then we've never looked back. And since most of our organizing is online, getting that national um, reach hasn't been super hard for us because we don't have that like block of, we only organize in person or in like a central location. We're able to have, we're, we're mostly concentrated in Oregon, California and like the New Jersey, New York area. Um, but we are, we are expanding our reach. That's fantastic. I guess 
the idea of having a decentralized community does, you know, challenge that the typical, you know, work hierarchical structure and like, yeah, and accessibility or ability for people to organize. But do you also feel like um, that the uh, the that it compromises the, the community feel, or do you feel like you, that the Raven Corps as a whole has been able to to tackle that, and you know that if there's no lack of community sense or a lack of like, oh, there's one thing to hang out in person and another thing to yeah. it's virtually. So yeah, yeah. Like? I think. The the virtual push occurred during COVID. Right. So we like transitioned there during COVID. And I think like, yeah, internally, it has been a little bit of a struggle to maintain that sort of community feel. But I, I feel like we struggle with that less than like the standard nonprofit kind of translating there because because we have a personality and we have like a really like unique brand of like take no prisoners, you know? So I think we attract a lot of people with personality who are able to like fit into our community and that kind of like lends itself um, in our favor, you know? So I I don't think we, I mean, everyone's been struggling with online engagement, right? Sure, yeah. 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 So I definitely think that's like something that we've all struggled with, but I don't think the sense of community has really been lost. I think it's been honestly strengthened online because everyone can like communicate with each other and talk about, how their actions in their locations are going. Yeah, and that's really important too because, you know, sometimes I think having this decentralized structure also encourages and empowers people in other places to to organize and participate and, you know, so that it's not the responsibility is always on one single organizer. Yeah. It's a collective effort, which is always great. And as you speak on this, I can't help but wonder what folks from different generations say like I don't know where to put myself I can't I don't know if I like come under older or younger I moment yeah. but I but there's always that that the common um phrase that like oh that the younger generation they're our future they're gonna save us all like they're gonna yeah I mean I guess that, that's that can sound kind of empowering it's like, yeah I'm the savior but that's a huge burden of responsibility to put on an entire generation and so how does that make you feel as a group of high school students um, who are in this movement You have the passion, you are dedicated, but at the same time, I can't help but feel like there is that expectation of the entire responsibility to be on you. And then others can just be like, look at how great they're doing. So we don't have yeah. to, like, what is it exactly? Can others do it's like, yeah, they're, they're probably going to save the world, but that doesn't mean we can just sit around and just watch Make it, it worse. Yeah. Or like yeah. watch things go in flames. Yeah. Well, one thing is that we're high school and college. Okay. And um, yeah. But I think I think we experience it a little bit differently because the in my opinion, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, or like within the Raven Corps, within the generation, I think that whole you guys are gonna save us all mentality that we've been like that's been forced upon us has really like fucked with the movement yeah because i think it gave i think it gives the wrong people savior complexes Mm -hmm. and the people who actually like not deserve the limelight but i i think i think we get the wrong people getting into the wrong type of work and then the right type of work gets defocused with this sort of like like outlook because i think i mean just like personally for me, something that's really affected our organizing in the Raven Corps is just like the effect that college admissions mm-hmm. has had on how people like view extracurricular activities and like volunteer positions and that sort of stuff, right? Because there are there are students who get involved in these sorts of like advocacy and policy positions so that they can put it on their resume. I'm not saying it's the majority of it. Right. all of it, but there there is a considerable yeah. portion of people. Or, like their right? heart and their their passion isn't there they're just doing it so it's a yeah yeah I get that and I yeah I think that has it is detrimental because I think the last thing that we want to do within the movement is try to replicate the systems that we're fighting against you know and I I think it's it's the it's a thing of 
we can't be the savior if you like keep telling us that we have to be if that makes sense because it's just something of like I don't know if I don't know if this is if any of this is making sense but it it, it does in a very abstract way like it's yeah be hard to put into words but it's a lot of pressure the expectations can be high but also it's like this we didn't create the problem yeah and it's it's this it's the sort of thing of like um people who want power should never have it i am a firm believer in that like um oh yeah like people who have who want power desire it they they they're the last people who should have it and i think telling our generation hey you guys are going to be the one that saves the world attracts the type of person that wants that sort of like limelight Mm -hmm. and that i think is where it gets messy because i don't think we attract those sorts of people and i think that when we're doing the work on the ground i think I, i don't think our generation has um as much emphasis on grassroots organizing, especially because of like social media, but also because many of the young figures that they see in like climate change, for example, they they aren't grassroots organizers. They do mainly like government advocacy, lobbying and that sort of stuff or social media like activism. Look at like Gen Z for change, for example, right? They're great when it comes to political advocacy, but if the main people that we see doing the sorts of advocacy are essentially social media influencers who i love i love social media influencers yeah but do i think that they should be at the head of a movement that should essentially be grassroots where most students who are organizing are grassroots it's that sort of thing of i think a lot of the problems that we see in like the quote-unquote like adult space of the movement we're also seeing at our generation which is of concern to me but yeah and i know i think we both follow Jay Conroy and his work, and he's been on the podcast as well. And like a lot of what you're saying is, you know, like I started thinking more about this after listening to his work in, you know, people worship putting people on pedestals, people who are, you know, very charismatic out there on social media um, and versus like the people who are grassroots boots on the ground, pressure campaigns doing that kind of work too, like, yeah, uh, the people who don't necessarily seek that that attention or that recognition, they're there for the cause. Um, but yeah, it is it is a very tricky, I mean, I feel like it's made to be a tricky space. Where yeah. It, it was uh, where it's like just trying to, I don't know if glamorize is the right word, but sometimes I do feel that way. no like the 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 dc baddie sort of thing of like i'm taking on have you like maybe this is just like i'm in like a little bit of an echo chamber but i've been seeing a lot of people like every single time i see a young person in dc they're like in my senator era and it's like what are you talking about? oh okay <laughs> you know what i mean that too and i think i think there's a space for both because yeah. you have to reach the mainstream somehow Right, you have to reach the electorate somehow. So there is definitely a space. I think if it was all grassroots, I don't, obviously as a grassroots activist, I think there are pros and cons to all of it, right? That's just how it works. And that's just like how pervasive the entire system we're fighting is. But I think it's like 90% that side of things versus 10% grassroots when it really should be like a a 50-50 split, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like recognition where it's, it's due is also important because sometimes, like you said, the, the accolades and the praise, which is not something that we are all like, we want to be told that we're doing a good job. That's not what we're saying, but you know, that it's, it, but it goes a long way to be recognized for something. So it can attract more people who want to do that kind of stuff because yeah, especially for, for younger people who are, you know, passionate, seeking community, want to learn more and get involved. And and what most of what they're seeing is, you know, some like really big media effort versus, you know, people who are doing something that is far more accessible to them. Yeah. Or as yeah. We, uh, activism, like that, it does go a long way to, to 
let people know that there is such a group that is lending themselves to make grassroots actions accessible across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think like, you know, I think COVID screwed us in multiple ways, but one of the main ways it screwed us is like social media activism of like, spreading information is really important. But I think people have forgotten that it's like step number one of 50 of like, people should know about the issue. But that's not that's like, good, we got that. What's next? Right? I I don't think people are really making that sort of like, connection to what's what comes after letting people know that a problem exists. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like that, that is, it's never easy, but it is easier than actually changing and like fixing the problem, right? Like all of this work is hard. I'm not trying to discredit the amount of effort that all of these people are putting in, but it's like considering the amount of energy and resources being put into like the standard like large nonprofit, like social media activism or that sort of like activity you would see versus the amount of energy that could be put into grassroots that's the thing that gets me because i think there's a lot of focus on like the federal like aspect of all of this in the states when i I don't think enough people understand like just how much their local community can do when it comes to like investing in climate change or racial justice like if you want to reform your police department that doesn't happen federally that happens with your city council right but you're not going to get on cnn for doing that yeah and that's that's the that's the sort of like thing that i think yeah no i know and i think that's just uh that is perpetuated from you know the throughout i feel like that's just a trend that i see within the spaces in general it's like we get the media, the biggest media attention versus what's effective. And that is a challenge to have to, 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 to navigate that. But I feel like also, you know, grassroots efforts and things that are effective, like we're trying to do a lot with bare minimal resources. Yeah. So it's like yeah. imagine the impact that we would have if we could channel that into, okay, exactly. more funding so you can recruit more people, so you can organize exactly. and do all yeah. that rather than being like, hey, let's play, like, you know, place this eye-catching ad over here yeah yeah like the raven core is two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year it's not competing against but we're vying for students and student attention against people who have 18 million dollars a year right so that dichotomy and the only reason that that split in funding exists is because of like the routine like de-emphasis of grassroots and i i think and it, it, it's so fundamental to like how we're taught history as well because when we're taught movements we're taught about the key figures in a movement but yes. that 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 ignores that there's probably like decades of organizing and hundreds of groups in order to get any sort of mass movement off the ground right yeah. Yeah. but you're not going to learn about the everyday guy who went on strike you're going to learn about the the union head you know yeah the person who asked nicely at the end of the day yeah Yeah. came at the very end was like so why don't we do that they're like we're just tired of this protest we'll we'll give in and they exactly exactly and yeah i think that does a lot to like like it go like let's go we go back to like radical and what we think about that Mm -hmm. i history is a push and pull between moderation and like progressivism right and you can't move forward without people pointing to the furthest direction possible and saying, I want that because it's all about compromise, but you can't have compromise without advocating for the ideal. You're going to like, yeah, if you're going to negotiate, like go for the higher end of what, like go beyond the higher end. So at least there's room. If you're just going to start with the settlement, then again, it's just similar to like just, saying like okay we're just gonna start with our advocacy by saying you know like let's give hens like an inch more space to yeah people. that's not yeah. start. exactly yeah and i mean we see that with like police reform let's just give them extra training that's yeah i've been training them for decades now guys like what yeah. 
and like on climate change, right? Let's just let's just get a little bit more investment in green energy. Green energy hasn't been working. We need to de-invest from fossil fuels, right? So it's this thing of like an animal agriculture too, which yeah, is that exactly not like now then waiting to develop our like by replacing the use of fossil fuels all the way to to green and renewables like that's going to say that requires more resources and like you said exactly best in, investment into that but again animal agriculture is something we can do do People like right now that. yeah yeah like we, we the dairy industry the yes. only reason it is being propped up right now is because of the national school lunch program and i don't know about your school but no one in my school actually drinks the milk that they take they 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 just throw it away or they take a sip and they throw it away like some of these industries are being propped up by waste exactly and, and yeah and there's just so much greenwashing that goes on behind it and yeah it is very very frustrating but like i guess one thing that like because you've touched on so many different things within liberation which i love that you know you're giving examples from other movements you're talking about yeah. racial injustice climate and like police from all of these things yeah so in order to join the raven for like how like do, do people have to be vegan the only requirement that we have is you have to be 15 to 22 and believe in collective liberation okay. and by that i mean like I did not I when I joined I was not vegan mm -hmm. and I'm I'm still on like the pathway to that yeah. and we accept people who aren't vegan if you're yeah. vegetarian if you struggle with being vegan because we know that it's not the most like accessible thing for a lot of people in the country right people of lower income people of color all of that so those are the only like two requirements that yeah. and internet access sometimes yeah yeah because yeah. I think when in fact because like you said joining this community has you know encouraged you and empowered you to make that like uh, to get uh, yeah. on that journey towards going vegan and like that is super important because like yeah we are an animal rights podcast but we also one but we also do talk about collective liberation we talk about like how the oppression of animals is like all oppression is related and we can't yeah do we can't have that conversation if we're not acknowledging other kinds of oppression and talking about these things? Yeah, we can't just just you know sit around and talk about this. We should actually you know do something about yeah. it. Um, and I think I've been in the AR movement for three years, and all of my involvement in the AR movement has been through the Raven Corps. So it's like a yeah. different like stand a lens than one standard. And I think like one thing we definitely struggle with. Um, or we've struggled with personally in the Raven Corps is getting people who are super into animal rights but are less educated on other forms of yeah. oppression and like trying to bridge that gap and having people realize that it, it it's not animal rights or human rights like um I mean a thing that we've we've had heavy internal discussion on is like you know the tactic of comparing what's happening to animals right now to the Holocaust I'm gonna say yeah you know, like those sorts of like strategies and as like I, you know, that that's just a, like an ongoing discussion. We've never made that comparison. Just yeah. 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 I understand. Um, but it's that sort of like push and pull of where we stand in conjunction with all these other movements. And a book that we kind of use as our like holy grail is um, Racism as Zoological Witchcraft by yeah, Al Cohen. I haven't read. Wait, did I read that one? No, I haven't read that one yet. I read there. I read Afroism first. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's it's one of my favorite pieces of theory ever because it's just so approachable. Um, but AFCO makes a not just an interesting argument, but one that I definitely firmly believe in, which is like, unless we truly liberate animals, humans can't be fully liberated either. Right. Because just like speciesism and racism, racism and that sort of hierarchical view of nature is what has resulted in so much oppression. And that sort of like full lens approach to like, if we want to fix anything, we have to go to the core of issues. We have to go to like, you know, we have to look at things multidimensionally and not just as like intersectional, right? And I think that's 
super important. And I think that's what we're trying to do, which is like we're trying to bridge these movements. And it isn't always easy. It definitely isn't pretty. But I, I think it is definitely worth the struggle because it's the only way that we can really like move forward, I think. Yeah. And it's going to make people feel a lot of comfortable. Like you said, like it's there's no change going to happen if we're all just sitting comfortably and yeah. I, I suppose with that um the uh like the the idea of collective liberation that we talk about that and there's also a very fine line between co-opting and like making a comparison for the sake of it versus like actually caring about the experience and as someone who is not of Jewish descent, someone who is not black. I, I think as a South Asian person, come with a set of privileges and yeah, and I, yeah, and you know the expectation to be like you know we're we're either I don't I think you can relate to like having that yeah like doctor or lawyer and yeah. So that's and like, I think also like anti-black le- rhetoric is so heavy in our community. Very you know? much so. Very, very, very much so. Yeah. I will. I'm so glad you said that. And there's yeah. also like the issue of casteism within yeah. the, the culture. So yeah. first, so like coming with those set. So I feel like the like I, I, I can't necessarily speak on like if I were to make the comparison even though it might in the literal sense make sense, like I think we're doing a disservice to the harms that it's going to cause by making this comparison. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, Cause I think I think there's been a lot that. of oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was just gonna say like it depends on who's talking about it. Oh, sure. yeah, for sure. But I, I think I mean I don't think any comparisons to the Holocaust or slavery should be made unless you are of Jewish descent right. or you are a black person and you yeah. are it, through your lived experience, you're like, yeah, that is a comparison that I'm. Yeah, and a lot of people have made, you know, like the the they they've embraced veganism and animal rights because of their ability to relate to that, and that's great. But that's not my space to go and, and see. yeah, and exactly. Yeah, I think that's also where we can gauge if someone genuinely cares about you know all of these issues, or like, are we just gonna pick and choose and. I don't know. Do you all ever get pushback from people within the animal liberation or animal rights, animal advocacy? I don't know what we're calling it these days. Yeah. Um, the movement um, of saying like animals deserve their own movement. Like we're bringing all of these things into this and that's diluting what we can do for the animals. Is that ever your, anything that you've experienced or not? How would you respond to that? No, definitely. Definitely. I think like one thing that we struggled with is we, especially in when it comes to op mom and talking about dairy in schools, a lot of people will focus on the the climate is change op, aspect. Is op mom. Yeah, that's Operation Mind Over Milk. That's like oh, okay, uh, okay, yeah, Operation yeah. Mind Over Milk. Yes, yes. Yeah. So in that, like, we do get some pushback because we, a, a lot of people don't emphasize the fact that it's it's dietary racism, yeah. right? And. I think it's not necessarily pushback like, oh, you shouldn't talk about this, but oh, you should talk about the the most effective things, quote unquote, right? Mm-hmm. Or like we should we should only focus on animal rights or we should only focus on climate change because that's what students will respond to or we should only focus on dietary racism. And it's that kind of thing of like, we're, we're not doing it so that students can kind of hop on for a specific issue. We're doing it so that students realize how connected it is to all of these different issues. And I think that's um, sometimes what people like struggle with, right? Um, Cause I think we're taught to think about things in a very single issue approach yes, because yes. that's what we see in like media and stuff, right? But I, I, I definitely think it's more effective. And even if it isn't more effective, I think it is required that we like tell people that like everything is interconnected and you, you we, we have to, understand and observe that and there is it is progressive and leftist to say that we have to focus on all of these multiple issues yeah and i think that's yeah yeah and one thing that i've also I'm, I'm hearing a lot of discourse on is like movements talking about like 
we don't want to get involved in the political side. We're not t- like, like, it's like, okay, whether you're on this side of the spectrum, that side of the spectrum, if you're here for this one cause, you're in. And I, I don't know how I feel. I'm still figuring out how I feel about that. And I think that's one thing with, and I, I feel like that's also a challenge within collective liberation spaces too, where like, yeah, we want to talk of like someone might be so passionate about climate change and want to talk about dairy. They want to get, get it out of school. They're like, yeah, I want to join the Raven Corps, but maybe they don't care as much about the other issues. You know, like, yeah. Like just racial or injustice, uh, LGBTQIA plus communities who are experienced. Yeah. Like, sorts of all forms of oppression um no and forms of depression yeah so like what is that yeah. like to create that that community because it the one thing that i hear is like then we're severely limiting the people yeah you're i not think this one pause. yeah yeah one <laughs> yeah on the in the on the community aspect of it i think it's like everyone's gonna have that one issue that kind of pulls them into things sure yeah right and I think our goal is once you're in the community, like the, the process of education and like getting people to understand yeah. all of the sort of like or sort of different aspects of it and like emphasizing it and really looking at it because people people might hear this and think, oh, you're asking them to like focus on too much. But the key is to realize that we're all talking about the same thing, yeah. right? Like it's the same thing. We're just th- looking at all of the ways it affects us. Yeah. So it's not like I'm not asking people to have three different focuses. I'm asking them to look at all of the symptoms and realize that it's like one issue at the core of it. Right. But I think one thing that we definitely struggle with is outside of the community. And this is especially in my job, because as policy and legislate, like the legislative lead, I have to look at just how like lobbying efforts. Right. So the rally that we have in D.C. is for the Ad Soy Act. And in meetings for the Ad Soy Act, it's bipartisan, which is great. But when I was attempting to set up Congress meetings, I was advised to also look at people on the far right who are fina- like fiscally conservative. And I was told to talk to the Freedom Caucus because they would be against government mandated mandates in nutri- food and nutrition. So that might be more votes that we could get for the act. And I remember talking to Claire about it. I was just like, maybe that that's effective on the policy side of things sure but that goes against everything that i'm for right which is i am not about to go to anyone who believes in what the freedom caucus believes in and ask them to vote for something even if they believe in even if they're against government mandates right and maybe that makes me bad at my job who knows (laughs) But I, I think for me, it's that sort of thing of um, compromise is necessary, but not when it comes at the cost of rights, like actual yeah. rights for anyone, you know? So I think there are definitely people and spaces who are willing to go there and go there, be my guest. But for us, that's just not, yeah. that's not how we function. And so with that answer, I'm wondering if... Um, does does that in and of itself get pushed back from people within the Raven Four too? Like, do you feel like it's like okay, at least we can get what we need to make this one thing happen? Like, I, I, and this is something that I grapple with all the time too. It's like, yeah, this person believes a certain thing that I cannot get behind. It's like a violation of my own rights. I feel like it's a universal yeah. thing, but we all just try to address it in different ways. And I've heard so many different responses of like, um, like, yeah, we, like, this thinks like we're here for the animals. And I, I get that. Like I, yeah. rights is why I'm doing everything. And it even brought me into the space of collective liberation, like to, to learn more about these issues. I wouldn't have become more vocal and proactive about this stuff if not for getting into it through the animals. But they will forever be my number one purpose. And yeah. Yeah. But like, I think I share your concerns too, with like reaching out to people who I just can, because their uh, alignment is so 
opposed to just valuing the lives of other people that yeah i i i can right i can definitely relate to that but i also hear the the the, the counter to that it's like like you said like it's yeah it's not how the world works we got yeah in the system but we also have that. but how do we do that when we're also trying to change the system and exactly no it yeah because like it's yeah it goes to the core of like how can we change something that we have to continue to function under and function within yeah right and i think like it's not as black and white as like oh i'm never gonna speak to someone on that level because like like if i go into the policy sphere that's gonna have to be something i do on the nonprofit side right and definitely internally we've had that like there are ravens who are like, I'm willing to talk to both sides because at the end of the day, it's all one party. They all believe in the, like, it's just, you know, they're, and I completely, I'm with that argument. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I think it's just a thing of like, you have to look at it personally. And I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't talk to Republicans at all. We're never going to get anything done if that yeah. doesn't happen. Right. And I I guess I'm just saying like, me personally, I just have to figure out if I have the stomach for it. Because it's a thing of, I mean, and the the sort of like building these like really strange bipartisan coalitions. I mean, if you look at like the anti-war movement, who would have thought Matt Gates was anti-military, you know? But he is. He's he's for defunding the military. So it's the sort of like weird crossover things of like, we're not going to get any progress done in the now if we don't reach out to the other side of the aisle regardless of what side you're on politically um but it's also a thing of i think it's like a question of how can we work with these people without endorsing their beliefs you know that's always the question yes. yeah. and i guess that's the benefit of being a non-part uh, non-profit is you have to be non-partisan, non-partisan yeah. so i think it's just a thing of yeah yeah. It's just like a continuing conversation that you have to have with yourself and with those. Yeah, you. no, I get that too because sometimes when we want to get attention on a certain issue, where we we try to seek out folks who we might not agree with on every other thing, every other issue that's out there, and yeah, that that it comes to that. Like, is this a compromise? And I think that's also a challenge that comes from within. It's like a blessing and not so much a blessing as a nonprofit to be nonpartisan. Yeah. And then like, but people like, but the people, nonprofits comprise of people. And yeah. we are all not necessarily nonpartisan people. And yeah, that's something that I think there should be some infrastructure or some sort of way to be able to navigate that because yeah, it's, you can stick a nonpartisan label on an entity, but at the end of the day, we all, when we talk about system change, systems comprise of people. So yeah. it's like, we can't, it's not like a magical entity that's just gonna say like, oh, okay, we're done. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the, there are people making those, those choices. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, that's something yeah. to grapple with a lot. I, I definitely think like, cause I wanna, I wanna go into law and i want to go into politics and it's it's probably going to be something that i'm asking oh yeah for the rest of my life you know like it's just like oh yeah. it's shit. like i disagree with them on so much but they could give me this win and it's a thing of like yeah. is it worth it yeah you know? yeah so, and again like once you get to that scale it's you're also thinking about other people and even now we're thinking about other people we're thinking about the dairy cows we're thinking about the people or the, the, the students who are first to consume dairy like we're like we're thinking about so many other things that are at stake as well and yeah. so i yeah it's a hard thing it's like should if i do this is this going to be a moral compromise or if i don't do this what's going to happen to exactly here which is to add yeah. all of these other issues yeah so yeah, I don't know. Um, but I think you're still doing, and I know that you're doing such important work that you have a big rally coming up. And so can you tell us a little bit about the, the well, I think once this podcast comes out, the rally will be done. But uh, you can tell us about your current campaign against the dairy industry and how like the youth-led group is taking on Big Dairy. 
Yeah, yeah. So definitely, I think I'll start from the very beginning, which is like the beginning of last year when we were looking for. We'd been like kind of organizing like the school food sphere of like getting more plant based foods in schools, and we decided that there there wasn't、um, a youth voice in the movement to try to get. Soy milk into schools. Try to get more alternatives into school, and largely try to get dairy milk out of schools.、Okay. Right. Just quick question: Is it only advocating to get soy milk into schools, or are there, are there other milks, or is it? So, in the perfect world, it would be like multiple other milks,、sure. right? But、um, the the main challenge is that because oh, I love this stuff. This is this is my bread.、Yes. So yes. the National School Lunch Program、um, basically only subsidizes dairy milk. Yeah, and in order to get what they would consider nutri- nutritionally equivalent, like alternative,、yes. you have to have a doctor's note, and、yeah. the district can choose whether or not they'll accept a parent's note, right? So soy milk right now is the only、um, alternative considered nutritionally equivalent, and that was very、um, very recent too.、Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah,、um, but even before that, it would only be soy milk because that was like the closest thing to it, right? Yeah. Um. So our main push has always been to get schools to accept parents' note in order to get an alternative, to get students to request the alternative, and to just get soy milk readily available. Yeah. And that would be the first like major push to getting milk out of schools,、mm-hmm. right? So our main action last year was our day of action that occurred on October thirty first. Where over a hundred ravens across the country tabled in their schools and their communities to pass out educational materials, oat milk, soy milk, and even pea milk,、um, just to get the word out about like this regulation exists. Help us in the fight against it, you know. So after that, it was really successful, and since then we've used that momentum to continue organizing in schools. And now we are rallying for the Add Soy Act, and that's our main like ask in DC, which is to get the Add Soy Act out of community committee、mm-hmm. and to get it to pass the House, right?、Mm-hmm. Um, and the Add Soy Act would essentially, literally, meet our first demand completely. It would provide soy milk to anyone, any student that demands it、mm-hmm. or requests it, regardless of parents or doctor's notes. It would be readily available, and beyond that, it would also reimburse the district、um, for the, the cost of soy yeah, milk. Cost. And the main problem that we encountered without the Add Soy Act was that you may request soy milk from a district, but it it. Is an extra cost burden for them, so they're not willing to really advertise that if you provide a doctor's note or a parent's note, you'll be able to get the alternative, right? Whereas with dairy milk, they get that money fully returned. That's what the National School Lunch Program allows the federal government to do, right? right? Yeah. So the Add Soy Act would amend the National School Lunch Program to make sure that that money gets back to the district.、Mm-hmm. So that's why we're going all the way to DC to rally for it because it is so crucial to the main like. Goal of getting soy milk readily available so that students have a choice and are choosing a beverage option that will actively harm them and go against their belief system,、mm-hmm. um, and to also hopefully get milk out of schools or at the very least severely hurt the dairy industry. Yeah, yeah. No, that's amazing to see this like this collective. Community and this organizing, it is very inspiring, and I love to hear about like, how these local efforts are now going into like, federal、uh, effect. And so, what was it like to work on the Add Soy Act? Is this a Raven Core initiative, or like, how did it come to be? Yeah, so the Add Soy Act was not like I'd like to make that very clear. Yes, There are、yes. other nonprofits who、um, helped write the bill, and then Rep Carter, who is a Democrat from Louisiana, and Rep Mace, who's a Republican from South Carolina. They're the main co-sponsors.、Um, so this is just an act that we really like that we are advocating for, but it is not an act that like yeah we we wrote we. Do not have the money to do that, nor do we <laughs>、right. have the connections.、Um, I am the singular person working on policy at the staff level, so、um, yeah. And there, there are a, the the primary ones are、um, Switch for Good, and I think the Humane Society of、okay. America. I think,、okay. I think so. 
Yeah. Um, we won't include the information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of nonprofits behind it. Um, and yeah, so we're going down there to lobby for it just because we really like the bill, you know? So That's awesome. And yeah. like, again, the, I think these are also ways to, to get involved. It doesn't have to be from start to finish. Everything is like by the group. Like you can always yeah. find ways to get involved with what other groups are doing. And yeah, and I'm like, not everybody has the resources or infrastructure, like you said, to to draft the bill, to write the language as expertise, but we can always yeah. use the skills we have to support and push for it, right? Exactly. So yeah, that's really awesome. And so from the 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 day of action that you had, like what what kind of feedback did you get from the students? Do students like soy milk or these animal free uh yeah like milk options, what has been the reception from students? And yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say it's been like overwhelmingly positive. Um, like I I don't think we got someone being like, no, I only like milk. And that's the only thing I believe should be offered. Cause that's like, it's like a dumb thing to say. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, it's just like, because I only like something that means it should be the only thing that's provided. Only I, 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 yeah, I don't know many people who had had that logic, but you know, hey, it's America. <laughs> Anything's possible. Yes. Um, but it has been overwhelmingly positive because it's a thing of like, when given the choice, I think students would choose soy milk. Um, or if, and I, we're not even like, it, I, I think most students would choose not to take, a, not to take milk at all. And mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the things about the National School Lunch Program is that for a lot of schools, the only way that the meal is reimbursable is if a student takes oh, a milk. Oh, and they, they have to keep like an inventory of it, right? And yeah, exactly. So, and that's at the that's at the elementary and middle level. And then for, for high school, it's like a different story because then it's like you have to get a certain number of elements, but still there's like the pressure to take milk, right? And if you don't take milk, it's not like you can take a bottle of water for free or something. Right. So the only beverage you can still take if you're on the National School Lunch Program is milk. And it's like even water isn't included in the National Lunch Program. Is it? No, no, no. And there have been lawsuits over over schools who have put water before milk in lunch lines. And the and dairy industry got these lawsuits in. Like, is there the a dairy, dairy industry? Plant? Like, are they monitoring where the milk is kept? That sounds, well, I'm not surprised, but that also sounds like someone has a, has way too much time on their hands to be yeah. monitoring where the milk is no. placed. Let me tell you, from, from, and it, it sounds ridiculous because it is, right? It, but from the research I've done in the USDA, there are two like marketing divisions within the USDA that solely focus on how to market dairy and dairy yeah. products yeah. to American consumers, right? DMI and Milk Pep, and they're behind Got Milk. They're behind all of these campaigns. And I know some people are like, oh, milk propaganda, is that really the worst thing in the world? These people are pushing the high fat, high cholesterol, whole milk products to communities of color specifically on purpose through fast food chains because they know that those are the only things available to them. Yeah. Right. So the, the the whole conspiracy here is that they have a bunch of product that they can't use. Yeah. That yeah. people aren't buying. So they are forcing it onto consumers of color and poor or consumers. It. They're just like, or yeah, they're or they're just dumping it. Yeah. Right. So it's like everyone who everyone who looks at like oh, America has an and of course, an obesity problem. But our definition of obese is ridiculous. Again, yes. yeah. you know. That is a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. But everyone who's saying like, oh, America's unhealthy, like our food. Yeah, that's new nutrition problem. Yeah. yeah, like the, that's the USDA is behind that. The USDA, the people in charge of our food are literally behind the epidemic that some would like sc the scream that we're having, right? Yeah. And that is a sort of like layer of government that I wasn't expecting with this issue that is genuinely present. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, it, it doesn't surprise me that someone puts water before milk in the lunch line. And I mean, I think most people, when Not given the, the choice, 
No, I, when I say like the first thing. Oh, you if see someone is then off water. for water over milk, that doesn't surprise. Yeah. Me. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And th- that, but also like it doesn't surprise me that when water is put before milk on a lunch line, the dairy industry would be like, no. Oh, yeah. Milk has to come first as a beverage. Yeah. Right. And I think it's just, I, I think it's personally just hilarious because it just shows you how desperate they are. That That is true. Like that's kind of how you look at it too. Even though it's frustrating, but it's like, man, you're pathetic. <laughs> That's so no, genuinely. The the Aubrey Plaza crap, like, oh god, they, I God knows how much money they paid that woman to ride a tree, but Jesus, I know who signed off on that. Buy or whatever marketing agency you hired for that, because good I God was good a bad movie. idea. That was terrible. <laughs> that was Jane. Gen- I, I remember watching it, being like, it. I was like, no. Are you kidding me? This is like cringe level infinity. I can't. Yeah. I'm sorry. You find wood milk a more disgusting idea than drinking cow's milk? Cow's breast milk? Yeah. Like, like hello? And, milk? No. Yeah. Yeah. And I say this because like, I think, I, I don't know what region of India you're from, but my mother's family, they used to own cows. They used to own goats. Like drinking milk straight from the cow unpasteurized just a generation ago was really standard, really common. Yeah. And I think the difference here is that people are really desensitized from what they're drinking. Yeah. Right? Like, milk is not advertised in the way that it might be in India. Because in India, it also has, like, a religious standing because of the... Yeah, and that comes with its own issues that we can talk about, too. But, like, there's also the commodification. Exactly. And just use cows as, like, yeah, we worship them. No, you're just... No. That as an excuse. Exactly. Them. yeah but there isn't even that level of yeah, like exactly yeah connection here it's just like you genuinely don't know what you're drinking and in india it's like a glorification thing right exactly but, yeah, it's like two different completely different problems yeah. w- related to the same issue and what really baffles me is like there's even a threshold for the number of like blood cells and pus cells that can be present in the milk that's found yeah. in the grocery stores and i was yeah. like requirement it's like oh there's like the number of pus beneath this amount like this threshold is yeah fun. so here you go i'm like i don't want to drink pus no thank you yeah yeah it's like it just sometimes it, it baffles me because we we really just yeah. honestly I, I i don't i want to do more research on the eating habits of like south asian communities before british colonialization yeah. i think that'd be fascinating but um, I I don't know many family members who aren't lactose sensitive. I like just oh okay yeah no yeah I, yeah you know what I mean because like Northern Europeans are the only group that has like a really high rate of um being able to digest lactose like right. the majority of the world population is lactose sensitive or intolerant and it's just like when you just lactose like, normal because yeah. Oh, we prefer lactose normal as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because then it's just like so. So what are we really doing to ourselves right now? Yeah. Like, we're just drinking shit that was makes us sick in the first place. Yeah, yeah. It's like we're like the only species who are consuming the lactation from another species, which means yeah, that way, it's pretty gross. Yeah, it's like yikes, guys. <laughs> come on. Yeah. It's like, is anyone really dying for a cup of milk right now? Like, what? No, no, we're all dying of protein. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're 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 actually doing this podcast from our deathbeds because we're protein deficient. It's yeah. like we're, yeah. we're we're about to pass away. That's so funny. Yeah. So, like, um, I, I, I just wanted. I I always wonder what it would look like if um if it's like motivating students to take action and then but we also have that you know but people are busy we're doing all sorts of things and so what how are you able to inspire young people to get involved and do people reach out to you do like you have these uh yeah you, you organize these actions and whatnot. You work with other nonprofits sometimes. So what is, how are you able to outreach to get more students into your community? Yeah, it's an ongoing battle, genuinely. 
to keep students in engaged and because I think it's it's just one thing that like going back to the conversation we had at the very at the very beginning of the hour is just like I think students have been like fed this like media sort of narrative of this like one student at the head of a movement and I think a lot of students are more focused on creating their own like organizations like the I like to call it the college nonprofit complex because all of these student nonprofits are disappearing once people get into colleges. That is true. Um, That's actually the same thing like for colleges too, where, you know, like as I work in the animal protection nonprofit too, like we'll have contacts yeah. within colleges to help with whatever campaign and then they graduate and then it's like, great, now what do we yeah. do? Yeah. Um, and I think it's this thing of like, um, create your nonprofit, do that. And I think one thing that we, we attempted initially early on was to like get students to create their own chapters and schools, but we realized very quickly that people are more like willing to start their own thing. So yeah. then we decided to be like, okay, let's just partner with them and provide them resources. And then yeah. they can just say, we're doing it in partnership with them. And that led to more success on the day of action when That's we like awesome. opened, when we opened that up. Cause it, I think it's like a challenge of meeting students where they are and then also kind of like balancing that sort of role of we don't want to just hand off materials and have someone take credit for yeah the work right yeah. Yeah. so and then like continuing to like try to engage students because I think like people are so burnt out yeah. I'm burnt out we're all burnt out and it's a thing of like the system wants us to be burnt out and like working past that and stuff but yeah, I don't have a I don't have an easy answer for how we can no, do that, and that's not like, because yeah. like, we've been around for seven years, and I wonder like what are the conversations about keeping it sustainable, keeping these yeah sustainable, such that even after people graduate, there's still some infrastructure there. And I don't exactly. know of Allied Scholars for Animal Protection. It's mm-hmm. a group by. And then uh, an amazing vegan activist, his name is Dr. Faraz Garcini, who's also been interviewed with this season of the podcast. Um, and yeah, th- I, that's uh, you might find the work that he's doing really interesting. And that's one of the things that he wants to tackle is at the college level of once the students graduate, like we want to create a solid infrastructure to, to keep the momentum going as far as Yeah. That. Yeah. And... I think that's what like us being decentralized, it like lends itself, lends us to be um, very adaptable Yes. to, yes. to COVID, to the I- increasing, just like scatterbrain that our entire generation is experiencing, myself included. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, um, so I, I think it's just the thing of like, because we're decentralized, it allows us to be more adaptable to these sorts of situations. Um, yeah, I think that's probably like the thing that helps us out the most. Yeah, um, yeah that sounds solid. And do you also work with, because um, I know you're into, you're very passionate about policy legislation that works. So I'm assuming you're familiar with the Agriculture Fairness Alliance. You- oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, Connie over there. Yeah, we're actually partnering with them for oh, the DC Connie. rally. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, Connie is quite a force to be reckoned with. She's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're actually our primary contact when it comes to like getting yeah. some, like attempting to get meetings set up and they've helped us that. a lot with the, the language surrounding, um, the rally. So yeah, yeah we love that's, them. That's, that's really wonderful to see, you know, people supporting each other, helping each other out and yeah. yeah. And so before I let you go, I have a couple of quick questions. One, how can people within the age demographic and people who are you know, inspired by collective liberation, they want to join the Raven Corps, how can they do so? Yeah, um, just go to our Insta, fill out the coalition form, and we'll let you in on the Discord, and you can start organizing with us. You can also join through the website. Um, If you're out of the age range, um, if you're younger, just wait, and as soon as you're 15, sign up. (laughs) Um, And if you're older, um, we love money. We'd love uh-huh. any money you're willing to give us. Um, please give us money. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, just like follow us on social media, support us there, repost when you can. I think it's just like 
because we're so um we're such like an online community making sure that social media is also um as best as it can be is really important for us um and then also we do make nice crispy treats we make vegan rice crispy treats to fundraise with so if you don't want to give us straight money if you want to get something in return there you go. buy some raven core treats um uh, do you ship them across the country yes there you ship go. them across the country um you if you're go. a vegan business we also do wholesale so you know that is i did not know that that's neat. yeah yeah. Oh, okay. That sounds super fun. And they're delicious. I have one yeah. waiting for me right oh, now. Oh, okay. I okay. I will wrap this up so <laughs> your treat. So before I usually like to end these episodes with uh one final question. And I think here I might modify it a little bit as to what does a collectively liberated world look like to you? How do you wow. envision that? That's so good. Um, I think, I don't know if you read any work by Ursula Le Guin. No, I haven't. Um, she is an anarchist author. She actually used to teach in Portland. I think she very recently passed away. By very recently, maybe like a couple of years ago. Um, Ursula Le Guin. Okay. I can I can um, yeah. send you like the exact spelling and she's she also writes science fiction um, and I remember reading an interview by her where she was asked like why are you an anarchist like why do you use that description and it's like that's like the ideal that I strive for right mm-hmm. which is I I think a world in which there is more of a focus on supporting the people around you supporting your community yeah. and an understanding that supporting your community also comes back to you um you know just like mutual aid but basically a society run by mutual aid um and i think just an understanding that we're not here to take it's not just take we're not here to just take from the planet and all of the resources we need to give as well like trying to live as balanced as possible in like the most metaphorical sense possible. I don't know if any of this is making sense. No, it does. I, I like, as you were describing it, I was like, what would that look like? Like, there's so many, I, I always try to think of like, what would the animal sanctuaries look like? Like, where will they be? Are they still going to be like, what will the city infrastructure look like? Cause yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what that would look like. Um, yeah. And I think it's a thing of, it's really important to recognize that a lot of indigenous communities before like colonialism and imperialism and all of that shit happened, were doing a lot of the stuff that, you know, we envision right now. Like it, yeah, it's, that is true. Yeah. It's Going not back to that uh, the harmony with which they lived with nature. With, and yeah. With the land and but with the infrastructure and the technology that we have today, like we're not saying that we need to to devolve those advancements, but how exactly all like make those advancements with the the goal of that harmony as opposed to exactly yeah extortion. Yeah. Just it's definitely possible and that's that's why we're here. We're escaping off the horns. I'm Yeah, you know. Yeah. Anyway, it was such, such, such a joy chatting with you. You are, I can see the passion and I can hear the passion in your voice. I see it in your face. And I've been following the work that the Ravens have been doing. Um, Thank you. For a while. And like, I, I tune into all your stuff and I just, yeah, I will. I, I don't want to be one of those people who are like, oh my gosh, these young kids, these <laughs> generations are so inspiring. But I just, but I just keep thinking like, I, what was I doing when I was 17? I don't know. Definitely not this. But yeah, I think, um, but yeah, I think if anything, if that inspires people who are older to also, you know, yeah, and do something, that's something I can get behind rather than just like, oh my God, look at all the good stuff they're doing and then just going about your day. Like, that's inspiring. And that's always the hope. Yeah, we need to step up also and join the fight. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Wow. 
I sure wish there was a group like the Raven Corps back when I was in high school. But maybe there was, and I just didn't know about it. So it really means a lot that we're able to share the remarkable work that the Raven Corps is doing, and the inspiring community that they have built. After all, you're never too old or never too young to become an activist and do the right thing. So if the work that the Raven Corps does resonates with you and you are feeling inspired to get involved and support their work, check out our show notes to get more information. And if any of you listeners are high school students or you know a high school student in your life, be sure to route this resource to them and ignite the inner social justice warrior in them. Please take a quick minute to rate and review the podcast. It helps others find it more easily, and the more people that find it, the more people can be inspired by the guests we have on our show and turn that into actionable change for the animals. And if you're listening on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. Our channel has educational workshops, talks, and so much inspiring and informative content that you do not want to miss out on. At AAM, it's important to us to offer our content and resources for free so that it is accessible to everybody. If you like the podcast and all that AAM has to offer and are able to support us, please consider a one-time donation or becoming a monthly patron. It helps keep us going. To make a donation, you can use our link tree, which you can find in our show notes. You can also keep up with AAM on social media, visit our bookshop, our merch store, and keep up with all the fun things that we have going on. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help and guide you through your activism journey. Just go to our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. So if you needed a sign that you should be an activist for the animals, here you go. Now remember that it will take all of us to come together and collaborate to achieve animal liberation. So stay focused, be courageous, be perseverant, and keep doing your part. And most importantly, take care of yourselves. Until next time.